Women met us at the end of October 2022, talking about a lot. <laughs> we had a pre little bit of pre-talk about South Africa, the state of, let's say, what is it? State of affairs, state of things in Africa, South Africa, but also the whole Africa with Hanali. And so I invite you to uh, introduce yourself. And if you want, just summarize what you said before. I'm Hanali, I'm here in Johannesburg, and here's me and Heidi were just speaking about um, some of the atrocities happening on the continent. And I was just sharing that if you haven't been in some of these places, you, one cannot really comprehend it. So it's almost like a fairy tale or a story, you know, you're not there yourself. And unfortunately, the effect and after effects of colonialism and the likes. And what was used like alcohol that was used to sedate people and um, that you can control them and the likes. Um, but there's something that I just want to add to that quickly is there is something about the people on this continent that they have a indomitable spirit. So no matter the external environment, they just keep going. They just keep going. And that's beautiful to watch and to witness sometimes. That regardless of what's going on in the outside world, they, they just continue. There's just no stopping and going to lie down whatever is happening. Um, so that in short, I'm honey, I'm complete. Yeah, thank you. That's also already a lot, what you, <laughs> what you said. And what struck me uh, really, what you said that when you haven't seen these places and the conditions, how the people live, you cannot imagine. And we Westerners, we think it's more or less everywhere the same as it is at home. There are little islands, no, which are the same, but altogether it's not. So I'm fortunate enough to have seen South Africa and I really can imagine how that is. So I'm Heidi, uh, that was my <laughs> check in more or less apart from the fact that I'm aching because I'm doing the olive harvest and you know, you ah, and even a little uh, further up, you know, and the whole body uh, feels that. I give over to Beatrice in New York at the moment. <laughs> um, Beatrice in New York at the moment. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think the a lot thing came from me. Um, I always tend to fill up my calendar. It's been that way. Well, I think I was trained that way as a child. I grew up where we were running around going to all kinds of openings and performances and exhibitions and all kinds of things. Um, and mama, what are you doing with your camera? <laughs> Um, anyway, so I think, I think I, it's in, it's in my blood or being or something to want to do everything all the time. Um, beautiful flowers. Um, yeah, I think it, it was, I've just been reflecting, I think because it's October, I've been reflecting on this whole year and what it's been about. And I started the year and, and maybe part of it was the end of last year was when I was a time period when I was working like six jobs. So that was the kind of a lot that was a lot of work and feeling very overwhelmed and trying to still do other things creatively and socially, but feeling very bogged down with a lot of different responsibilities. And then starting in February, I started to disconnect from those jobs and ended up by June leaving New York altogether or at least moving away um, and just started traveling. Um, and now I've just been doing a lot of like fun creative projects that I'm interested in, a lot of traveling, a lot of seeing people, seeing the world running around, which has been a lot of, it's been great. Um, but I'm tired all the time. 
Um, and I, I keep, I left New York with the intention to rest. That was the reason I left New York was because I was feeling overwhelmed and it was too much. And I wanted to take a break and rest. And instead I've just been doing a lot in a different way. So I guess my, my real question or topic is rest or how do you rest or, or how do you balance the, like wanting to do everything and finding equilibrium? All right, that was my very long check-in. I'm gonna to pass to my mother. Yeah, I was thinking you are still waiting for your breakfast, but your mother is already having breakfast with lovely flowers. <laughs> Over to you, Victoria. Yes, I apologize for eating, but I to tell you the honest truth, I, I had um, forgotten about Women Matters today. So um, so I, I otherwise I would have tried to arrange something anyway. Um, so please pardon my eating. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been sick for the last, I don't know how long now, five days, four, five, six days. Um, I finally took a COVID test last night because it felt a lot like COVID, um, like the symptoms, but it, but it was negative. So, so that's not what it is. It's probably a flu mm -hmm. since it's flu season, um, with autumn, but I, so I've been feeling really, really depleted. It's kind of like sleeping sickness. I just want to sleep all the time. And, um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess I'm, well, I don't know if I'm doing too much. I don't know. I, I finished my lecture series, one lecture series last Tuesday, and I had started a new lecture series the week before that. <laughs> Um, and I'm, so I'm in the middle of the other lecture series right now. And then I'm um, negotiating for a concert, which is very, very stressful because the, I'm meeting with, um, with opposition in terms of the fundraising for the concert. So that's a constant stress. Um, so I'm not surprised I got sick. It's just a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of trouble sleeping and, um, sort of keeping my equilibrium. I mean, I don't have trouble sleeping. I sleep all the time. Um, but when, I, when I'm supposed to be sleeping, I'm um, having nightmares and I wake up in the morning and my I, I've been having really bad headaches and I was starting to get worried about the headaches. And then I realized this morning that I think the headaches are all being caused by tension because um, this morning I felt like I had locked jaw. I couldn't even open my mouth. Um, without exercise, well, I won't demonstrate, but <laughs> so I think it's the stress of what's going on right now and the anxiety and, um, and then it doesn't help to, to get sick, whatever's going on. I don't know what it is. Cause it's, it's not like a tradition. Well, anyway, I don't talk about symptoms. That's boring. Um, yeah. So I think that's enough of a check-in for me. Sorry. I'm still kind of <laughs> in the days. But I'm glad to be here. Thanks for reminding me, Beatrice. I, I I was just in another zone. So I'm really glad to be here and see you. Mm -hmm. I think I have to remind the Women Matters women that we are still meeting. And next week, next time, probably, no, I think we can avoid the, the, the um, uh, how do you say, this change of, of summertime it's only one week this time where we are sort of, you know, having to turn around so that New York is only five hours from here, while now it's six hours from here. But I think it's only for one week and we meet on Mondays afterwards, so it should be okay. But still, I will have to remind the people that we are on and that we are talking. It's too much. It's a lot to do, no? Also, reminding the people, writing the, the, the invitations, putting up the video, sometimes writing an article. It's also too much, you know, but um, just to be inside of the topic. <laughs> For me, the olive harvest is, yeah, on one way too much. On the other side, I see after three days, I'm getting more vigorous. So I'm coming back into some old 
forcefulness, how do you say that? Uh, you know, before the first day of, oh, oh, I'm getting old, oh, I'm getting old, you know, and today it was much better. And then with the provision to see you, that was really exciting. So it's too much, but maybe it's okay. I was just noticing just in our composition of four people today, the, the pinks and the yellow and the black and white. I don't know. I just I just wanted to point that out. I, just, <laughs> I think we look very nice together today, even if we're a small group. Yeah, it's nice. That, um, how are these flowers called in English? Carnation. Oh, I don't know the name. I've never known. Okay, nice. So are they Nelken in German? Nelken, yeah. In Nelken, German. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're carnations in English. I um they've always been my favorite flower. And Hanali, um, yeah, Hanali said they're her mo mother's favorite, so that's really nice. Mm -hmm. I I always loved them because from the time I was a really little girl, I always thought it was really fancy um when I went to people's houses and saw that they had fresh flowers, because my mother never had fresh flowers. And um so with the little bit of money that I could earn as a child doing various things, I would buy myself a single flower and I would always buy the biggest carnation I could find in the store and take it home and put it in a vase. So <laughs> carnation, they were my grandmother's favorite too. So I think that's also part of it. But I love the fragrance that they have. These, these the pink ones have especially nice fragrance. Um, in Germany, that is the flower of the death. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> too bad, yeah. Uh, at least as far as I remember. But uh, we can connect because the end of October is also the, uh, I don't know how you call this. The, all Souls. Yeah. Mm, all Souls Day uh, and All Saints Day. Yeah. All our Heiligen, so, yeah. Yeah, and then come the three weeks of... Uh, remembering the death, the dead people, no? Just Mark had passed uh, three, four years ago and yesterday, oh, oh. maybe, even, was it yesterday? No, what is it today? Yeah, yesterday was his birthday. So oh. Mm. oh, how old would he be? He would have been uh, 81 now. Wow. So. His mother was 100 when she died, so he was very sure he would arrive there, but he didn't. <laughs> well, my husband's mother was almost 100 when she died. She was just a few months away from being 100. So he thought, and, and he took after her because she had jet black hair till she died. She never had a gray hair and he had jet black hair. He had, um, but he died he was only 72 when he died so mm -hmm. there's no so way to this. yeah I'm, I'm working one of the projects i'm working on right now which um started at the beginning of this year and it's kind of going in stages um is called it's called the morning machine <laughs> m-o-u-r-n morning um and what we're working towards is building some kind of a like a storefront interactive installation experience something um, around grief and mourning. Um, and right now we're in we're workshopping some ideas because um, we're hoping to to make have something happen in, next year. And the conversation we we're having last night. Um, was about, well, one of the conversations was about longevity and about number of years lived and different perspectives on that. One of the people in our group is from China and she said that in her village or in villages nearby, um, life expectancy used to be really low. And so it's actually very typical now for funerals to be celebrations because if you live longer than 80 or if you live, longer than a certain age there's no more it's not sadness it's just celebration that the person was got to live that long and in her village the life expectancy is lower than the villages around so they actually celebrate 
even you know even this is even lower threshold of like when when is it worth celebrating um but i was also thinking about you know what if what if we considered a life no matter how many years it is to be the right amount of time like what if that is the amount of time that that life was meant to have and we look and celebrate those years um, rather than getting so sad and caught up in the poten the potential of something that never happened and never is going to happen. Not to say let's not be sad. I don't know. I was just I was just trying to think about like what if I shifted my perspective? I had a friend who died at age 26. Um and I was 25 at the time. He was a year older than I. Um, you know, I don't know. It's hard to think about that. It's hard to think about 20, 26 years being a full life, being enough. And what if that life is very mundane or not a lot is accomplished or a lot of it is spent? I don't know. It, how, do you, how do you reconcile all of that? You know, like what, what, is, what is a life lived and how do you reconcile it all? Anyway, those things are rattling around in my head right now because I'm actively working on this project and we're talking a lot about death and grief and that's good. Our different experiences, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, came to my mind as we were starting with too much. There are people who can't make it to die. They want to die and they can't. And they feel life too much, even younger people in depression or something, but also old people who I, I met some, she said, but I'm old enough, I have rift, I want to go, I want to go. And they feel that it is all too much to stay. And you know, apart from dying, but in life itself, there are so many moments, at least for me, where I think, oh, it's too much. I can't do all this and I can't bear all this and so on, you know? Then we find a way somehow, if we are fortunate to, to deal with it too much. But isn't that, um, how do you say, at least in our civilizations, a regular a company to life that all the time it's too much? Or not enough and then too much? <laughs> Hanene, you, you seem to... Yeah, in South Africa, I can only really speak for South Africa at the moment, but I, I realize it's happening all in other parts of the world too, with young people specifically. There are so many uh, suicides in high school children currently. From all some from all, and it's not a specific sector of society. It's all just clear through. So it's not that some are more fortunate than others and the likes. It's like they it's like what's going on in the world is just too much for them. They can't stay. Um, it's really scary if you think about it, because I can't think of any gen, any generation while I was alive that was like that um, in the past, you know, my years that I've been on earth. But I totally agree with you, Beatrice. I also see it as celebration of what whatever it was, and if we just stop judging it for good or bad or not good enough or whatever it it's actually some it's actually it's actually okay and if it's my my experience of death was always it was about those who stay behind not who's really who left it's they who are experiencing grief and i remember a dear friend of mine many many years ago he invited us to his dad's funeral and his dad committed suicide and because his dad was an older man, the, his dad's peers who came to the funeral were all dressed in black and suits and the ladies in black dresses, but the younger people were all in colors because he warned us, he said to us that this is a celebration of my dad's life. If you knew my dad, he, that's what he would want, a big, big party. He wouldn't want people crying. But what was beautiful is that at his house where, where, where this celebration was held, the older people were not aware, he was, he was respecting their views as well. So he created the most beautiful uh, video out of his dad's experiences from his 
from his photographs and telling the story of <coughs> it. And so the older people could go and watch that you know, and they could cry if they wanted to cry or do whatever they wanted to do. But he had a tent there and there was lots of alcohol and all sorts, you know, nice food and everything. And at one stage he took the microphone and he said um, to the older people, you all knew my dad. You knew he was like a very fun guy. He loved life. He really lived his life. Whatever made him make this decision is his soul's decision. But you don't have to, you, you, this is a party. You can take off your jackets. You can even swim if you want to swim. And in that moment when he gave them permission, everything changed. It was so beautiful to see these older people suddenly, all joyous, telling stories about his life, how funny he was and all these mischief that he kept on doing and stuff. But it was, it was such a paradox from the start to then when they were prepared for a traditional funeral. And here it's a big, big celebration of this man's life. It was just most beautiful. I, was, I myself still remember it. It was so funny, actually. And what he did is he was very creative. His dad was very um, witty, you know, in the things he said. So what my friend did is he took little notes and he created all these things his dad said. And we all got, could choose one out of a hat. <laughs> I won't repeat here what his dad, but the one was that I got. It had to do with sex. <laughs> but it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. It, it was so hilarious because it really brought him into that space as if he was still alive, you know. So it was such a beautiful experience. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that because I've been to many, many funerals and it was really sacred and most beautiful too. But this was special. This was really special. So Beatrice, I vote for that too. Well, the Irish, of course, um, the Irish wake is is based on that idea that it's a party um, and a celebration of life. And so the it's I've never been to an Irish wake, but I've seen lots of them in films. <laughs> but they always seem to have an abundance of food and drink and um, even dancing. And people tell stories and they sing songs. And actually, the the um, the service that Beatrice and I organized for my mother was, it was kind of a mixture. It had, it had two different parts to it, but um, the first part was, was more serious, but not somber. Now that, that was in the church. And then uh, the second part was in the church hall where we had, um, we had music performances. And then we ended the, the whole event with, uh, with dancing that, that, uh, with the musicians played and we all danced and it it was very much in keeping with my mother's personality because she was a party girl and um, she would have loved the she would have loved the whole event because of course she loved being the center of attention anyway so <laughs> she would have loved all of it but um, but I wanted to say something about the the thing about the the full life that Beatrice brought up that I've often wondered about that because of certain um artists and um well i mean most most noticeably of course um like mozart for example who um some people actually studied that it, that even if even if you hired they, they did some kind of estimate even if you hired a music a professional music copyist just to copy down all the music that mozart composed it would um it would take longer than he lived to do it. And so it's that idea that this, the, there is something that when you look at it, especially, I mean, I don't know with, you know, there are probably lots of people out there that we've never heard of that, that um, you know, that lead, that have a short life. But in the case of, of artists and, and, you know, composers, poets, whatever, who die young, it seems that they work at a much more, a much faster, pace and there, there's more intensity almost as if they knew or I guess you could argue the other way and say they work themselves to death <laughs> that they I mean that idea that you know doing too much which is our you know the too much theme you could say well maybe they you know they overdid it and and finally their bodies just you know gave out so 
but but it is an interesting equation. It's, it's, there's something there, I think. Yeah, Victoria, my daughter, I can't remember which artist it was. Um, I was, earlier this year, I was getting really in a state of, I really can't do all this by myself anymore. Whatever I've been gifted to send, share with the world, I just can't do it by myself anymore. So there was a bit too much theme in it. And she reminded me of this artist, I can't remember who it was, but she also said, do you realize, it was one of the painters, how many, when they discovered when he died, they discovered all these paintings and, and not all of them, and, and not even a percentage of them was famous. He painted so much during his life. Now, I can't remember now, I'll, I'll ask her again who it was. But in that moment, it was like, I think something that the too a lot or too much comes through on that theme for me personally, is that if you're creative, you just can, you, you're like a creative machine. You just, you know, you don't get tired of these things. You just do it, you just do it, you just do it. Beatrice, you sometimes remind me of my younger self as well. You just do it and you just do it and you're just coming through and you're expressing it in different forms at different times of your life. And then it's like, but it's not the thing about famous or anything like that, but it's like the recognition of it. It's like, nobody's really seeing this stuff. It doesn't look like they're really getting what you're doing. But in terms of an artist is you continue and you continue and continue. And I only really got the perspective when she mentioned this artist that his fulfillment was not in the ones that got famous and known. It was him just continuously con creating, 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 because that was what he, in his blood and that's what gave him joy. And that sort of shifted it for me too. That doesn't matter what the world thinks, just keep doing the stuff that you're doing. But Beatrice, I must say, rest. <laughs> and I have to say that after, after that episode, the environment started pushing me to stop because we had all these power outages. I couldn't do anything online. 12 hours without power during the day. It was almost, almost like the universe orchestrated that, that I can just stop. That I can really get stopped in my tracks. And then I went last month, I did tell you ladies about to nature where I was completely mindless for a week. I didn't do anything. I was prepared to go and write and do stuff. I couldn't even write. I couldn't do anything. And when I came back, it took me a week to settle back into life. It was, and now my senses are so heightened. Everything is like much louder, much, everything is too much, it's much, too much. I don't know how to explain it. My daughter is experiencing exactly the same because she was there with me. And it suddenly, everything is just too much. You know, it's like, what happened with us? You know, we, 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 it's so nourished in nature because they, you could hear yourself breathe at night. It was so quiet and suddenly all this noise, it was just too much. <laughs> and my body's still struggling with that. It's, it's because I, I, I perceive everything in overturns. And obviously there's a reason for it. But, but the reason why I'm sharing with you, Beatrice, is you remind me so much about myself when I was younger. <laughs> but you must rest, please. <laughs> And take it easy. I my problem. I keep thinking that if I go somewhere different, or if I schedule a day to do nothing or something, that 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 if that's enough to let me rest. <laughs> and it's not. I I always manage to put something in there to fill it with something. And so I I think I'm realizing I have to I have to really be more intentional about what rest is or find a way to not, I don't know sometimes I think I feel guilty for for stopping or like it's not allowed or I don't know um but I think also about like when the lockdown happened in the you know March of 2020 um so many people that I know just hung around in their houses and you know learned how to make sourdough bread and I mean that's the big trope everybody learned how to make sourdough during the pandemic it's at least here um and and just like watched tons and tons of movies and did nothing and I think about that time and yes I was at home but I did I did a month-long 
um, technology like boot camp thing on Zoom that had sessions all day long, sometimes simultaneously. I was writing my thesis. I like was I curated an online festival. I um, had multiple Zoom groups that I was a part of. I was in an online performance. I like in that time where everybody took advantage of the external stopping and actually stop themselves. <laughs> I still managed to figure out how to fill up all my time. Um, so anyway, it's it's a it's a tendency and it's it's very hard to break. And I tend to I tend to be like magnetically attracted to other people in my in, in the world who do the same thing, which is also dangerous because then you know if I don't have some, an idea of what to do, someone else is inviting me to something or whatever and then it just keeps going finally you are writing into the chat <clears throat> do you want to to say something about it all the works need more time to process yes <laughs> that's true because you because Beatrice you you first I just want to mention my granddaughter she is if you look at her you could just see how her head's processing all the time <laughs> It's like a it's like a computer i mean she's still little i mean she's uh, 10 years old but younger people process a lot quicker because you came in on a higher level of consciousness into the world a different level of consciousness so to speak. so a lot more of your of you are ignited than us older people so for us you you know the younger ones might look crazy because they're always so busy busy doing all this stuff but you can actually we, there is some research done on this. You can actually integrate the process a lot quicker than us older ones who've been here longer. And so that definitely affects, but it's, I understand what you're saying because that's, that there's that impulse and you just go after the impulse. And you'll be highly frustrated if you stop doing that. You actually get sick because it's not who you are. But they need to be balanced though. <laughs> I had a, this is, might seem like it's off topic, but it was a really profound realization I had yesterday. Um, as you, I think you all know, I've, my too much experience, my main too much experience of the pandemic has been studying Buddhism. And um, it's just like increased and increased and increased till like, now I'm part of, I don't know, like a dozen communities around the world. Um, and it just, one thing leads, leads to another. I've just recently joined a couple of new groups because of retreats I went to and I met teachers that I admired. But yesterday I was at a, um, th there was a session that was led by a, a, a Buddhist nun. She's originally from Great Britain um, and she became a, a Buddhist nun and she started a monastery in Northern California. But now she's decided that that's too much, and she's um, the, the monastery is is dissolving, and all the nuns are going to different places. And she's she's said she's take, going to be taking a sabbatical. But it was a really interesting experience that um, reading her biography, like a lot of my teachers have, you know, multiple degrees. They're they're psychologists and sociologists and Buddhist teachers and they've studied, you know, the Buddhist sutras or they've studied, you know, they, they, they there was one last night who translates the um, sutras from Chinese. I mean, it's really, so these are highly educated, sophisticated people. And because I have that bias, an academic bias, I assume that they're going to be the best and they're going to be the wisest and they're going to be the ones that I can learn the most from. And yesterday I had this profound experience where this woman who has, I think, no formal education, I think she, you know, became disenchanted with life in Great Britain. I think she came from a, you know, poor family when she was, you know, a teenager. So she's, I don't even think she went to even finish high school, maybe. Um, but she went to Asia and she, you know, sat at, sat with the monks or whatever in Thailand or whatever. I have never experienced such incredible wisdom as from this woman. 
So this whole idea of the, I mean, it relates to the too much to me in the sense that we put so much emphasis on all these outer things. You have to learn this and you have to go to this school and you have to get this training and this skill and this and that. And, and the reality is if you are really dedicated and focused, you can gain so much wisdom you, you don't have to you don't have to worry about those outer things I mean I don't know it, it's it seems like it's um I just was so impressed with that and so moved because especially it wasn't just in the way she talked it was when it was time for questions and answers it was really like going to you know the Buddha himself or something the the insights that she had and very simple very down to earth nothing fancy but as if she could see into the souls of the people she was talking to. It was so beautiful. And I, it really humbled me because I thought, you know, all this emphasis on, you know, rushing to do the next thing and get better and get promoted. And, you know, our whole society is built on, I think on false values in a way that this, this ancient, ancient, you know, she's, she's like the, I'm sure like the ancient sages were, especially in Asia where it's, you know, it's just about, quiet time and having the time and the focus to gain wisdom that is within like at letting yourself grow from within instead of all this outer chaos so anyway it was just was very impressing uh, impressive or whatever i was <laughs> yeah thank you victoria it makes me think about richard Rohr, who has written the book falling upward and where he says clearly that life is, has, let's say, two parts. And the first part where Beatrice is, you do and construct and, and everything. And <clears throat> when you really want to grow up, you need to give that up in a certain moment of your life and become the, the elder, let's say, the really mature uh, person. And then the values change. I, I re recommend this book. It's, it's really, really good. And so uh, he says, uh, it, it, the second half of life, let's say, no, but it doesn't really be a certain age. No, he says there can be 80 year olds who are still in the first half of life because they haven't gained wisdom. They are still doing and, and you know what you said also about the academic knowledge, that's not wisdom. That's something you know, but it's not, Wisdom is something more than than knowledge. It can, in my opinion, it can use knowledge to to become wisdom. But knowledge itself is not wisdom. And I, I mean, it comes. I'm associating now the our world situation now is because of knowledge, but not because of wisdom. If we had wisdom in around in as a as a means of of being in the world especially our leaders, we wouldn't be in the situation where we are now, you know, but they know a lot of things and they think, oh, well, we do this and we do that, blah, 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 blah. but wisdom is there not. So saying that everything in life has its time and it's perfect when with 30 years, I, I, I came to Italy to study finally singing, you know, I mean, opera and that's where you still break up and not break up, break out and uh, and uh, try to to pursue what 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 your purpose in in the outside life is. And then there comes the moment when you find that's not enough. Now I have to go inside and see what's going on there and how can I develop that. So nothing wrong with it. And the young ones, for me, um, I've met so many incredibly young, amazing young people that are so wise. And I, I personally also associate that when we were growing up, our, our, you know, our generations, we were growing up at the time where knowledge was power. You know, that's why people studied so many things and the likes. But the younger generations, again, it's linked to coming in at a different level of consciousness into the world. They, they are, there are so many of them that's wise. 
that's not, it's not only about age. There are also some of them who's incredibly, incredibly wise without having gone through all the experiences we have gone through. And I love chatting with them because then you realize actually how wise they are. The things that disturbed us when we were much, much younger has no real relevance on their lives. Um, and I wouldn't say it's but all of society, but they are most definitely lots of them. And, uh, and they struggle because I've done this, an informal study a few years ago where I spoke to young people from all over the world and just to understand what's going on in their lives. And they were all complaining that they are so easily dismissed, that they, they, that they don't know enough. Um, and it's really sad because when you go into deep discussion with them, it's, you actually are wowed. You are, it's extraordinary what wisdom they come forth with. But they, the society is not supporting them for that wisdom to be brought into the world yet because it's not recognized. Yeah, this is amazing to hear. I, in my surroundings, I haven't seen anybody like that yet, but <laughs> maybe I will have the chance. I mean, we have Beatrice here, but I mean, in the, in the, in the real life, not in the uh, Zoom life, you know, I haven't seen anybody yet. Well, I think um, a lot of, a lot of spiritual people feel that we come into the world with wisdom and then it's kind of, you know, beaten out of us <laughs> through the, um, I mean, it, one of my favorite poems when I was um, young was um, by Wordsworth, where he says, um, the child is father of the man. And it's um, the whole, the whole poem is about um but it's called intimations of immortality. And so Wordsworth is looking at everything in life in terms of how actually the, the true wisdom is, is coming with the child into the world. And then, and then how, how life, if, you know, only if you stay close to nature, can you maintain it somehow, but it's, it's, you know, with society kind of pushing down on you, it's very difficult. And, um, and I think that's, it's very true that kind of wisdom. Well, Beatrice was incredibly, I mean, I don't know how, why she is now, but um, <laughs> she was incredibly wise as a child. She was, um, people would go to ask her for advice because we took her everywhere we went. And um, I remember many times I'd be looking for her at a big party when she was only two or three years old, and you know, all these tall people <laughs> looking for this little child. And then I'd find her in deep in conversation with some people who were asking her advice. And she even gave advice to um, the, the son of this, um, this composer that we knew that he had two girlfriends and he didn't know which one he should marry. And Beatrice was only maybe five years old at the time. And she listened very gravely and seriously to, you know, the whole story and asked a lot of questions. And then she she pondered for a moment and then she told him which one he should marry. And he did. He took her advice. And um, and the last we heard was very happily married. <laughs> but it was, you know, is that 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 wisdom of the child that is un, somehow uninfluenced by, you know, social mores or conventions or whatever. So um very yeah untainted exactly so um are you do you remember that Beatrice <laughs> now you need to give yourself advice <laughs> I'm wondering if this has to do with the fact that when we are children uh, we are still more connected to the other world let's say to the the other realms of existence and then we are sort of forced into this material reality and then I know a, a person who has written a book, uh, Integral Psychotherapy, and he says, when you grow up, then uh, grow up, uh, you know, in, in psych psychologically and socially, Ken Berber, no? the, the stages of development. Um, then at a certain point, it's like the veil goes away. Before, when you grow up, there was a veil, veil over these capacities. 
and then it goes away again and you have uh, the possibility to reconnect with this sort of intuition or whatever you want to to the direct knowing let's say and then also to to wisdom why when you are only in you know or you maintain there are many children can probably maintain this string of existence no by uh, parallel to the normal normal life uh, or you can uh, re refine it later and you know that's promising so this is wisdom when we get knowledge out of a different source out of a <laughs> I don't even know. It's not necessarily a felt source. No, it's just um, coming into you like an artist. No? There's this, this inspiration and you do. And we can also have that for, for life without being an artist. Well, Kandinsky wrote that, that all, all creative people, all artists, but create, creativity in general, comes out of um, inner a sense of inner necessity. I mean, he wrote innere Notwendigkeit in German, and um, I think that's that's that was very insightful. It's that sense of an urgency that you. I mean, something that I wish I had more of. I've, I've <laughs> despaired because I I admire. Well, Beatrice, for example, um, has it like uh, that sense of like really needing to create something and and just that urge that, that to create and like you were saying Hanali um not not worrying about you know what the purpose is or is this does this you know matter or is it worth anything or what does society think that the the true truly creative person doesn't doesn't even pause to think about those things because it comes from the inner necessity so it's organic it just comes you just have to do it because you have to do it. And um, I really admire that when I see it in people that, that because it's, it's also a sign of integrity that they're, they're following their own creative spark and they're not letting society influence them. You know, that I remember when Beatrice was, you know, she said she wanted to become a dancer and a choreographer and my whole our whole family and friends and everybody descended on her, you know, is with this judgment, you know, why do you want to do that? That you won't make any money. You know, you have to go to college to the whole reason to go to college or to go to university is to learn some skill where you can make money. And they knew she was really gifted at math and, um, and she loves math. And she, and they said, you know, well, why, you know, why don't you do math? Because that can be applied in any field and you can make tons of money and all this stuff. And um, I was the one person that had to like shield her <laughs> from from all these all these you know the wiser elders that were trying to push her you know into a mold to do something that would be you know it's all about money and um, she she was true to her her calling which is you know I think in itself is proof of the calling to be an artist that you you really listen to that voice and you follow it. Sorry to talk about you in the third person, like you're not here. <laughs> now you can speak for yourself. <laughs> oh, that's most beautiful. My daughter had the same. She wanted to go study art and everybody was bombarding her. Why do you want to go and study art, fine art? Oh, you can't make a living with that. And she thought through and she, she went and did it anyway. Um, but yes. It's um, unfortunate that it's always sad for me that when, when such gifted young people are pushed into another mold by their parents or the society or the teachers or whatever, the friends, whatever it is, and then I am happy. I remember a, a, a gentleman, he was the CEO of one of the big electronics company in Turkey where I worked. I was doing a leadership awareness workshop with some CEOs and really playing with them in very creative ways. And at the end of the workshop, he said to me, oh my goodness, I should not be, have studied in, as an engineer. I should actually leave this company and become an artist. 
And I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. It's a bit drastic. You can do that, but it's a bit drastic. Just use your artistic skills in your in whatever you're currently doing. So you're, you're more your right-minded abilities, being more creative and things like that. Because he was on the verge of just leaving everything. <laughs> and most probably his family and his, his the people, because he, he had 800 people working for him, well, almost probably would have been devastated. But through that process, he, he couldn't reconnect it with that creative spirit. And then he realized that he was not an engineer by heart. It was just the intellectual thing. And it made him very sad. So it was, it was I still feel it in my body now that he's, he's awakening in that moment. But my goodness, I should have been an artist. What am I doing with my life? And he was still in his 40s, so he still had time. But it was just such a sacred thing to be present to, for somebody to rediscover that impulse, that whatever it might be, it might not be an artist, whatever it might be, to reconnect to that. And through such a playful, very simple process, to be able to get there and then to have that recognition. So he, he looked at me and he said to me, you, they are much more about you than you are showing <laughs> because you took me for, into this space. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, that's why I play. But it was, it was, it was through the play that he discovered it. that he, he came from that very right-minded type thinking that world into that creative space to really in his heart connect with it. It was just beautiful. And that's what I love about my work. <laughs> this is wonderful, Hanuli. Can we play with you, Hanali? I don't know what I don't know what you're talking about. We just need to do it. Yeah, sounds wonderful. Yeah, I wanted to come back to the topic of too much for the end of our conversation because what is definitely too much is our orientation towards the mind and the thinking and the rationality and you know be in the material thoughts everything on materialism and we need a balance between uh, creativity and the other but what we are doing now is even worse we, during the lockdown the arts were shut down everything was shut down you know so uh, to to many people say to have a thriving society you need the artists because the artists can intuit a new way. They can intuit solutions. But if you don't permit artists uh, to, to live, you will always repeat the same thing because nothing new can come into the systems uh, you are uh, living in. So when do, do we want to understand that every artist is not just an artist for him or herself, but also doing a service to to, to the whole society. No, oh, they just paint a picture. That's not, uh, you know, that's how people think, but it's not that. It's more than that. And yeah, we need to, and, and Beatrice has the, has the whole life in front of her to do her part in art. <laughs> and you too, you are doing art too, and you too, so even if it's lo um, more slowly in our age, but <laughs> we will do our part. So nice to talk to you. We had a quartetto today. Just a short check out. What is not too much? What would you like to be uh, just fine? <laughs> Well, what's not too much is feeling you all know my body. <laughs> it can never be too much. <laughs> Just bring it on, bring more. <laughs> Thank you, I'm complete. <laughs> um, delight, joy, beauty, discovery. Those things are never too much. That's me. Beauty. <laughs> Flowers. Um, no, that's what I love about nature. There's it's it's never it's never too much. And um 
I now now that I'm studying Buddhism, I hesitate to say never enough because um, <laughs> that, that's a dangerous dangerous thing. But um, but I feel like yeah, I feel like the the answer to all of our questions is to be found in in nature somehow. In in whatever respect, yeah, I, I actually envy you. Um, oh, that's a really bad thing. Um, <laughs> Heidi, with the your olive harvest, I think the, I mean your your life, I think, you know, you have the 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 that beautiful foundation of nature, and the you know the growth and and harvesting and um, such a beautiful thing. Can't wait till we can visit you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is is true, but you know. I having this life for more than 30 years, 35 years, I realized that I, for the other people, I'm strange because they are completely uh, locked in a completely different life. I'm feeling more down to earth, you know, more, oh yeah, and look what is there and, and how can we do that? Oh, invent this, invent that, and so on. <clears throat> and the normal things like dressing up and makeup and this what for so it's it's my values i think are completely different than most of most people you know so and it's never too much to express yourself in in a certain way you know and also my animals they they wait for me to give them food the little one do, can you hear this <laughs> she wants me to stop so thank you ladies and we see next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.